How you going? It's another balmy evening on the edge of hypothermia beside a footy field. And uh, just between you and me, it's as cold as a mother-in-law's kiss out there. And I reckon I've got Buckley's chance of getting uh, warm any time in the next hour or so. But uh, interest, speaking of Buckley's chance, see that? Segway. I'm getting good at this. Um, Buckley's chance. Who was Buckley? And why has he been immortalised in the Australian vernacular? That's a question I also ask myself, and it turns out that uh, today, 7th of July, 1835, is fairly relevant to Mr Buckley's story. William Buckley was born at uh, Martin in Cheshire in England in 1780. He was reared up by his maternal grandfather, and he was sent to school and apprenticed as a bricklayer. He joined the Cheshire Militia and later the 4th Regiment, and in 1799 he served in the Netherlands and was wounded in action. After his return to England, he was convicted at the Sussex Assizes for having received a roll of cloth he knew to be stolen and was sentenced to transportation for life, which just goes to show just how seriously the Poms used to take their cloth. In fact, the very first female convict to arrive in Australia, Elizabeth Thackeray, was sentenced to transportation for the theft of five handkerchiefs. That's right, five handkerchiefs, the vile woman. Uh, anyway, uh, Buckley was transported to Port Phillip in 1803 and as a part of a party uh, under the command of Lieutenant Governor David Collins, they were tasked with establishing a settlement on the Mornington Peninsula. At some point during the endeavour, Buckley and two of his fellow convicts decided to head to the hills, so to speak, and they buggered off. Uh, not really sure what they thought they were going to do with their newfound freedom. I mean, at uh, that point, the total population down there at the bottom of the mainland couldn't have been more than a couple of hundred white people. It's not as though they were going to be able to melt into the crowd. Anyway, unsurprisingly, their bid for freedom didn't go particularly well. These were men from the mean streets of England. They had no idea how to feed themselves in the wilds of Australia. After a couple of days, they sent a distress signal from the other side of Port Phillip Bay in the hope that Collins would see it and come hasten to their rescue and they'd all be happily reunited, sit around the campfire with a few ales and a couple of laughs. Uh, it wasn't to be, as uh, Collins didn't see the signal. Uh, Buckley's friends decided to head back and uh, they headed off, leaving Buckley on his own. These two were never heard of again. Buckley fed himself on shellfish and berries, but this was never likely to be a long-term solution. And luckily for him, he was found by Aboriginals of the Wasserong tribe. Now, Buckley stood about six and a half feet tall in his pantaloons, and seeing this tall white man, the locals believed he was a reincarnation of their dead chief. Not wanting to risk the wrath of the chief, they took Buckley into their tribe. He learned their language and their customs, and was given a wife, and he had a daughter. Buckley lived among the Watanong for 32 years, living mostly in a hut that he built near the mouth of Brim Creek on the coast of southern Victoria. During this time, Buckley said there were occasional white visitors to Port Phillip, and although he considered giving himself up, he was afraid of what might happen to him if he did so. And so he decided to remain hidden. That was until July 1835, when he overheard the Aboriginals plotting to rob a visiting ship and murder the white intruders. Yeah, he must have suffered a fair degree of divided loyalties at this stage. On the one hand, the Aboriginals had become his family. They'd saved his life, given him a wife, and shown him their culture. On the other hand, they were planning to murder his own kind. Eventually, he reached the, the decision, and accepting that he may face some serious consequences, he, dis, he surrendered himself to John Wedge on 7th July 1835. At first, he had forgotten his own language, but Wedge was able to identify him by the tattoo mark on his arm. And I'm assuming that six and a half feet tall, wild looking white blokes weren't exactly in abundance at the point. Wedge thought he would be a valuable intermediary between the settlers and the local Aboriginals, and he managed to obtain a pardon from Lieutenant Governor George Arthur. John Bateman was still in the process of establishing a settlement in the area, which would eventually become the city of Melbourne. He employed Buckley as an interpreter and was able to convince the native inhabitants of the area to sell the rights, as it were, for a few blankets and various shiny things. Buckley later became an official government interpreter. But Buckley seemed to be caught between two worlds and came to feel that neither the Aboriginals nor the Whites trusted him entirely. And it's got to be said, each side probably had some justification in this. But probably feeling as though he had few other options, he left for Hobart in December 1837. He became assistant storekeeper at the immigrants' home and from 1841 to 1850 was a gatekeeper at the infamous female factory, which I might do an episode on at some more appropriate time. 
On the 27th of January 1840, he married Julia Eagers, also known as Julie Higgins, the widow of an immigrant and lived a comparatively uneventful life until his death in Hobart on 30th of January 1856. So there you go. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you want to be advised when uh, new episodes are posted, just click on the subscribe button that's down there somewhere. Uh, if you want to find out what I'm up to, go to my website at warwickoneal.com. Uh, if you want to check out my blog site, it's uh, notyouraverageidiot.net, where I blog on all sorts of things from four-wheel driving, single parenting, whatever comes into my head. So I hope to hear from you soon, and uh, cheers. See ya.